Um, hello, you know what's crazy about this year at Comic-Con? Tell me. That it's like a thousand degrees on the rest of the planet, and we're suffering from huge global warming, but where we're sitting right now is actually a little chilly in San Diego. It makes no sense. Uh, everybody from Phoenix, which is where I'm at, that just set a national record for the most consecutive days of 110 or more, will now be moving over here and vacationing on this terrace. So this is going to be now a tourist trap where we're, you and I are sitting. So we got here first. Yeah, we're, it, we're the pioneers. But the thing is, like yesterday wasn't chilly. It's act, like legit we're out, where we're sitting right now. There's like a wind tunnel. Yeah. And it's like, but anyway, listen, man. It's nice. So um, I've told you this before, and I'm going to say it again. Um, I'm a big fan of your work. I grew up reading your work. Uh, you had a real impact on me in terms of where I'm at now with Collider. Just getting me into the space, reading comics. Mm -hmm. Just want to thank you. Oh, no. Well, actually, I, I think that there's not enough acknowledgement going back the other way, right? I, to, and I did this on a couple other interviews of thanking people like you. I, I, I think at times that what people like you and what your platform do gets taken for granted, especially when, when you have things like the pandemic, then it really becomes obvious to me your, the importance of what your group does. And now, even here this year with the lack of Hollywood, right? There still needs to be information coming out. There still needs to be fun. We need to engage with fandom, regardless of what's happening at any given time in the world. And so I'm going, look at, they're all gonna come and they're still gonna put tons and tons of news out there. And yes, it would be fun to have more Hollywood news, but you know what, that's not a reality. But there's still a lot, and you guys are still doing your, your job. So I, I, you guys are, are a lifeblood to our industry, too. So thank you. Well, one of the things about this year at Con, and, and, I, and I don't know, maybe you're on the convention floor, you have a booth, maybe you can yeah. tell me. Uh, when I walked around on Wednesday night and Thursday, yeah. the floor was on another level of crowded, and it's because there are less panels this year. <laughs> yeah. So everyone is shopping this year yeah. in a way that they, I don't know if they've done in the past. Yeah. No, they're not in a line for eight hours, yeah. right? So they have to reallocate their time, and they're going, okay, well, I normally would be lining up for Hall H or that big panel. That's gonna be four hours of my day. I've already allocated that. That's not happening. What am I doing during those four hours? I, I keep saying, I think that there's an interesting documentary autopsy to actually interview all these people. A lot of people say, okay, I know you bought your tickets hoping for the whole Hollywood side. It wasn't there. Tell us what you did instead, right? Sure. And, and just listen to how they basically went, well, I, I, I like anime, so I did more anime. Oh, I like toys. I went over and did toy. I, like, maybe they just slept more. Who knows? No, right? they're on the convention floor buying yeah. exclusives yeah, and just no, shopping. Yeah. Um, I, I got a bunch of questions for Do you. Let, let's go through these. Okay. Um, in an emergency, mm -hmm. what are you saving at your house? Because if you have like three minutes to grab stuff besides your family and oh, pets. Shit, okay, they're out. They're out yeah, already. They're already out. So what are the things that are in your house? Like whether it be shoes, toys, whatever no, I, it is. Uh, that I'd be lamenting that I didn't go back in and get scorched a little bit for. Wow. Um, pr not, not too many, but... Uh, I, I used to have all my uh, high graded books in the house, right? My action number one and stuff. But my wife said, you better get that out of the house, right? I don't want that in the house, just in case somebody knows it's in the house. Sure. So I don't have to save all my high graded books. But probably a couple things off the top is uh, I've got a 1971 Kellogg's baseball uh, set. That These are the cards you got out of the cereal box. You could only get them out of the cereal box. There were 75 of them and you couldn't send in box tops. I have the complete set all in PSA 10. I have the top, I have the, actually I've got like five sets on PSA that are number one, but if I only could save one, I'd save the 71 uh, baseball Kellogg set. And then uh, I'd probably grab, I play like sim games, uh, like board games. So I'd probably grab the 72 baseball season because that was when Steve Carlton became my hero. He's a lefty, I'm a lefty. Uh, it's a dice rolling game. I probably grab one board game right now. My favorite board game is a game called Imperial Struggle. I think it's a genius chess game. I, I like chess games. Um, and what else would I have to grab out of there? Uh, probably the, uh, oh, I, 
I, I, I do have uh, a couple pieces of artwork that I need to grab out of the, that's right. I, I have a couple, most of the artwork someplace else, but I do have a couple pieces hanging on the wall I'd have to grab. Uh, who do you think sh should be on the top of the, the Mount Rushmore of the comic book industry? No. Who's on the Mount Rushmore for you? And if you have three or four people that you can put on it. Uh, well, the, the, the easy one for me is, is uh, uh, Jack Kirby and Stan Lee. Those are one, two. Well, they're, they're right there. Um, probably have to put Simon and Schuster just because they began th this thing that is now here with us, right? Sure. So, you, you, I, 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 again, you don't have to say they're the best artist, the best storyteller. You just have to go, they, they put the first step on the moon, right? Um, so I put them up there, and then between sort of the beginning and, and the big boys, um, man, who, who else do I think sort of has climbed the mountain that high? I, I, again, now I'll get a little personal. I, I think John Buscema. I think John Buscema did a giant body of work that was just magnificent um, that was up there. And if I had to put somebody from today's world on there, then I'd, I'd probably, and this may seem a little bit biased, but I'd, I'd put Greg Capullo. And here's why I say Greg, I mean, for modern. And again, I'm, 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 I'm arbitrarily picking one just because of the quality of his work and the body of work and the deadline, right? So Jim Lee is amazing and people say nice things about me and I've got other people, but to do it for that long of a time, which is why I put John B. Sema. Sure. People who do a body of work for so long, I just, I know how hard it is, so I'm just amazed at him, which is part of Jack Kirby. You uh, just, I mean, you, well, he, he's going to be Here's his one. body of work. Yeah. So body of work to me matter, and then, oh, by the way, they draw really good. So, yeah. Um, how has the comic book industry gotten better since you started yep. and gotten worse? Um, gotten better easily is the talent level is way higher than when I broke in, right? Because back then, you know, we're talking about the mid 80s, you either had to be in New York or in that vicinity to send it. So it was essentially whoever was the best artist that had the attitude that lived within a thousand miles of New York in North America, sure. right? And mostly America. Um, now that we've opened it up with the internet and people can post their artwork and you can now find global artists, right? All those people that were discovered because they were in the basement in Ohio 35, 40 years ago, they're now globally, right? So I have people now that work for me from Poland and Korea and Russia and Spain and Mexico. So, I mean, I, I grab from all over the world. I think that's magnificent. So again, the competition is really high because it's, it's, it's amazing. The, the downside of that, I would assume, uh, as a young kid, is that now the competition is really tough. So before, like I look at what the way they draw now and I go, man, if I could draw like you with my hustle, whew, you think I'm doing good now? I would, I'd, I'd, I'd be up by the moon right now. But there's so many people that are great that, that they get lost in it, right? And so it, it, to me, it's like all these great artists that are not, to me, getting their due um, that are there. And then, and then I think even here, I think there's a little bit of enticement of going to conventions and doing sketches and just doing covers and just doing like these one-offs, making money. And I get it, everybody's gotta feed their baby and you gotta do it. But I don't think long-term it builds a career. It makes money and it gives you a little bit of reputation. It doesn't build a career and it doesn't turn you into a, a potential brand. So it's hard for me to find people that wanna do interior artwork and do bodies of work. Sure, you, you have a very successful toy company yep. and you've done a lot of cool stuff What's the IP that you would you're still dying to get your hands on? Uh, it's actually a bigger it's a bigger answer than that. The the theory is in my head isn't that there's one I'd like to do. It's that I think I should if I could write every contract in toys that the the last paragraph on every contract, no matter who gets it, right? Hasbro, Mattel, Playmates, uh, everybody else. 
the last paragraph says, and with this property, McFarland Toys gets to do one figure. <laughs> because then I'll get to do my one Star Wars, sure. and my one Transformers, and my one Marvel, and my one, whatever's the hot one, I get to do one just to say, this is what it would look like if you gave me the contract, right? Uh, and, and pass it on, because, uh, yeah, I just, I look at a lot of stuff and go, man, just give me, come on, just one, right? Uh, but that's it. I am waiting. Have you tried, because I know the license is impossible, and I ask this of everyone, and maybe yeah. my asking this will bring it into existence. Okay. Um, the, the big thing that fans want is Blade Runner, and it never gets made. Oh, because that's the, interesting. Because the license is just so, I guess, complicated, yeah. or I don't know what the reason is. But have you tried for Blade Runner? Um, I would be surprised if we haven't. I don't know off the top of my head why we didn't get it, but um, I've been told no hundreds if not thousands of times. And usually what we do, so I'll go back and look at that one, is... Um, By the way, I would love it if you were like, wait, there's, I can make some, you know yeah, what I mean. Yeah, yeah. So what has historically happened with us is that we go and ask, and if they say no, then there's usually two reasons. It's no because we don't want to do it, we think toys are schmalty, or because somebody already has the license, sure. right? Those are the two. The one where it's like, ah, you know, we think toys are small to and or there's a complication. Then we go, well, well, okay, what if we come back in two months? And, and you come back and you come back and you come back. Let me tell you, early when I was making toys, the people at Apple Records said, we will never license a Beatles toy. Todd, stop asking. So I just kept asking and eventually they went fine, but it's gotta look like animation. Right? Yeah, it has but, to be Yellow Submarine. Right, but. Yeah. That's better than no. I got, him, I got him away from a no. Jimi Hendrix was the same way. They're like, I'm not gonna sully his reputation with a plastic toy or whatever. And I kept trying to show them what it would look like and it would, I think it would be cool or whatever. And then eventually they went, oh. I, because they, they're thinking of like a 499 toy from when they were a kid in the aisles and they're projecting, right? Just like people who don't understand comics. And you say comic books, they think of Archie and Superman because that's what they did when they were eight, right? And they don't know that there's now this whole litany of titles that basically has a wide range, just like the movies and the TVs they go to. So. What do you think? Um, McFarland Toys has made a lot of toys. Yep. What do you consider your top three in terms of, you know what I mean? Like, are yeah. there three that you just like, oh my God, I love these. These are, these are just great. Um, so let me see off the top of my head, because I don't really have one that's a burner, but there's an amalgamation of some, right? And so to me, when I was making toys, they kept saying, you can't do that, you can't do that. Even sometimes my own factory. No, you can't do that, it won't work. And so I would just go, well, let's just try it. Like, I, I want to see with my eyes it doesn't work. And then it would work. And I go, guys. So um, I remember we used to do grooves uh, grooves in uh, the baseball players for pinstripes and then we'd have to do a wash. I thought it looked clunky and it was messy. And then I go, why can't we just tampo the, 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 the pinstripes on? And they went, yeah, but we can't get all the way through the wrinkles and all. And this is why when you go over to China that when they say no, it's because they can't make it perfect. And I keep trying to tell them, I'll take 90%. 90% of cool is still pretty cool. Yeah. And so when they finally did one, were they right some deep folds they couldn't get the pinstripes into the machine couldn't get into yes but it looked 10 times better than the other way right i'm like guys so i go okay so there's certain ways you can tampo i remember we did one hockey player where the folds on the on the uh, uh jersey i think it was brett hall i go that's how i want to see folds i turned to my sculptors one time we we did hair on a female and and the grooves were like twice as much as we did and it held up and I went guys we can now start doing hair that thin they said no we can oh by the way we can do 200 paint uh, applications on it and still get it within budget and then probably the one that sort of rounded it out for me was we I think it was the mandarin spawn and the Mandarin Spawn had all this super detail on it and super sort of sophisticated painting. And they all went, Todd, get ready, get ready for a disappointment. And when it came, I went, shoot, that held up pretty. Like, so that's your disappointment. 
then let's do a lot of disappointing toys <laughs> exactly. from now on. So it's interesting where everybody else's head is. And here's why, in the toy industry, when you go over to China, they have been beaten for decades that everything has to be perfect and clean. There, it's like every Uno chip has to be exact. You can't miss the dots. You can't have any smudges on it. And they have been beaten relentless. And I come over there and I go, hey, I want to make a toy that looks like it's been underneath the couch for like two months and it's all grungy and it's all dirty. And they get nervous because they think that if they do that, you're not going to pay them because they're used to perfection. So if you're doing splatters, they can't replicate splatters. I go, I don't care. That means everyone's going to have a different splatter. Awesome. And they get, they get fidgety. And I go, no, I want you to do a rub on it. And, it's like, and, they're, and they're going, well, it won't be exactly the same. Exactly the same. They're, they're, they've been so used to no, replicating. It, it, by the way, it totally makes sense from their perspective, though. Yes. They're, because this is how you typically do it. Right. No, no, no. And I get it. But when I said, guys, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to write a letter that says, no matter what they turn out, I will pay you your bill. So you're getting your money no matter what. I just need you to do this. And sometimes I'd have to drag them across the line to do it. And then they do it and they go, oh my gosh, look at all this. And then they would take my toys and go get more business. And all of a sudden they go get more business from a Japanese company. And then they'd kick me out because they go, ah, you're not giving us enough orders. <laughs> and so they would take my blueprint and then kick me out a little bit later. Um, Spawn has been popular for... I want. I, I apologize. Was it '92? It came out. Correct. What? So what? yeah, we're years thirty-one. Yeah. Right. So what do you think it is? Because sometimes characters don't stand the test of time. Yeah. What has it been? What do you think it is about Spawn that so many people love it for so long? Well, you know what. I, uh, so let, let's just step, start with the thirty-one years, right? It's hard for me to imagine that if you take any character and you're just dogged, and you go, "I'm going to do it." regardless of sort of the ebbs and the flows, for 31 years, eventually you get, when, you get, when you get sort of the upticks, people go, oh yeah, that's right, that's that thing that's been around now 10, 20, 15 years. I mean, like, the time does matter. They, people now know it's not going away, sure. right? So they just got to accept it. So now if given it's part of the mythology of superhero comic books now, right? I mean, if you're essentially 37, 38, because you probably didn't remember from one to five uh, 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 in your age, that there, you've never s spent one day that you remember where Spawn doesn't exist. That was a world I lived in, in my head, with Superman, Batman, Spider-Man, or whatever else. So if they just were always there, I just gave them credit that they were valuable. So Time matters. I can't seem to get this across to creators enough. I just had a conversation with somebody yesterday. So that matters. Then, if you can then take that and put story and content in there that people like. And if I was to do a word cloud of Spawn, I think the two biggest words would be dark, badass, cool, right? I mean, I think that would be it. And maybe cape off and change off in the corner. But I think just... He's just a badass dude, and I think people respond to that not only with my character, but with any badass character that's out there, whether it's Marvel, DC, or anybody else. I, I think people just like characters that push back and sure. aren't, aren't Boy Scouts. You are, and I, I apologize for not knowing the exact details, but you did, or are doing, the Do the Evolution 25th anniversary Correct. video. What can you say about it? Well, again, it came out 25 uh, years ago sort of on a lark, I, I remember getting a call out of the blue from Eddie Vedder, which is always a, sort of a weird phone call, uh, right? I, I, by the way, <laughs> I, as I am a huge Pearl Jam fan, I wouldn't know what that's like. Not, not right, but it's just like, Todd, Eddie Vedder, I'm like, huh, from Pearl Jam? Oh, hi, Eddie, like, okay, Eddie. Uh, good talking to you too. Um, anyways, what was happening is that they wanted, uh, at that time, they, they, the record album, the record label was bugging them to do another music video. Oh, I and, remember. And, and, yeah. and they were resistant because that's just who they are, right? This is awesome. They're a group that doesn't want to be on camera, right? They're like, no, we got to do a music video. We don't want to be in our music video. That was their whole goal. Uh, and, he, and he said, hey, I've been watching the HBO animated show. We now know how we can do this. We'll just animate it. I got a song called Do the Evolution. Uh, it's about all time, space, and dimension. We need to do all that in three minutes. Are you up for the task, right? So I'm going, 
time space and dimension. So from the beginning to the end of time, three minutes, let's do it. Seems, seems like we can pull this off. Um, and then, and then the thing that blew my mind out of that initial sort of getting set up, he said, I I'm going to send you something that just sort of gives you my vibe. And I went, yeah, okay, cool. And I thought he was going to send me a rec his soundtrack or he's going to send me something or an example. And what he did was I get the, the very next day, I get this thing in the mail and it's a VHS of my Spawn HBO show edited to his song, Do the Evolution. And so I could see sort of the tempo. And it, I, I wish I had it because it was super cool. I just like, that's wicked. Oh, but hey, Eddie, uh, who, who did that? I did it, Todd. No, 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 but who, who edited this? I did that. You edited that, yeah. You have an editing machine at home. Yes, I do, I have an Avid. You, okay, so rock and rollers get famous so they can get money, so they can buy editing machines. <laughs> I, I, I guess I thought you guys did different stuff with your cash, right? But, uh, so he was, he was really into the process. So that even at the end, when we actually did the video, at the end he was like, hey Todd, we're off, because they were touring. Hey, we're off tour, is it okay if I come into the editing with you guys and help you edit it? It's your video, you can do whatever you want. The answer and is he, yes. And he's really good and he's smart and there's a lot of things, right? Even to the bitter end, if you watch that, that uh, video, the last sound you hear, you don't hear it all the time because they cut it, but the last sound you hear is crickets, right? It's basically lights out, it's over, right? But he put the cricket, he's going, what if we put the cricket sounds in there? Like just out of the blue, like uh, we, we're just going to fade to black, there's nothing. But then we put it in and we went, okay, if everything's dead, theoretically so would be the crickets. But it just sounded so cool that it was like everything's still at night and that's all you hear. And so we kept in it. And he was doing that throughout the whole video. So there's touches of him throughout that. The... The silly funny story real quickly on that one was every day he came into the editing bay, he was bringing a briefcase. Briefcase, briefcase, briefcase. Didn't seem like what rock and rollers did. And then he'd leave. And i go, you got another meeting? No, I'm going home. The next day he'd come with a briefcase, put it down, and go, hey, you going to another meeting? No, I'm going home. And he never opened up the briefcase. And on the third, fourth day of the editing, because we're getting near the end, I curiously said, hey, Eddie, uh, what's, don't mind me asking, I'm not prying, what, like, why are you bring that briefcase every day if you're just going home? And he goes, oh my gosh, Todd, I didn't think you were going to ever ask. And then I, <laughs> I went, and I still to this day go, well, what if I didn't? And he walked over and he goes, click, click. And he opens it up and there's two brand new glove, baseball gloves, because he's a baseball freak. Two brand new baseball gloves and a baseball. And he goes, you want to play catch this afternoon? And I went, I, I go, what? He goes, I heard you went to college playing baseball. Yes, I played back then baseball. He goes, I know, I hear you good. And he's a baseball freak. You want to play catch? I'll play catch with Eddie Vedder, it's super cool. There happened to be an unseasonably heat wave that day. It was about 107 in, in, in Cal Southern California. Eddie, classic, dressed black boots, black pants, black shirt, black leather jacket. And he's smoking as he's playing catch. <laughs> I am telling you, and of course, you know how macho men right, are. It's like, it's getting hotter and hotter. I'm from Phoenix, I'm like a cockroach. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not giving in to Eddie. It's getting hot, but I'm like, fuck you, Eddie. I got this, I, and Eddie's like, oh yeah? And then I could see that I go, I, I think he's gonna pass out. I like, but he would not have given up. And I went, Eddie, you wanna take a break? If you do. And I knew, I go to answer, so I better give him a, I, no, 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 I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a bit hot. And he's like, yeah, okay, fine, me too. And then he went, oh, 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 oh. And I go, if I, had, if I had just been a little more macho, there was a possibility I could have killed Eddie Vedder that day, or at least given him a, heart, a heat streak. So, but a heat stroke uh, that day. But anyways, I, I don't know if he would have ever opened up the briefcase that day if I hadn't. I would have asked, asked him on the first day. I, w I couldn't have made it to third, uh, but I, listen, I want to ask you some no, other I things. No, I just thought he was going to a meeting. Yeah, I, I have, uh, so there is a, a big, I know you're a huge, obviously, uh, you, sports collectibles, yeah. but it's really in the last year or two taken off with these box breaks 
these live box breaks, searching for like one offs and trying to strike yeah. gold. Yeah. What is your take on this whole box break and the the sports collectible industry leaning into all this? Well, well, I, I would put uh, sports collectibles in the category of any collectibles, right? There, there's no one way to say that's the right way to collect, right? I don't think, it's sort of like religion a little bit, like believe whatever you want, right? So if that's how you get your joy of collecting, doing it that way and it worked, and there's enough people to support that, knock yourself, knock yourself out. Might not be my cup of tea, I'm over here collecting a different way. But it doesn't mean that the way that I collect, the way that you collect is better or worse than the way anybody else is doing. It's like listening to music. You listen to your music and enjoy it. You don't have to listen to the music I enjoy. So collecting to me, I think, is, is almost like tasting food. We all have our own palate of what's interesting to me. The only thing in collectibles that, I'm, that my antenna's up on is when I think some people on our side that have the product that are just a little bit of hucksters and are taking advantage knowingly of our consumer, right? And, and I, I think if you just treat people fairly and, and price things fairly, then you'll have fans forever, right? I want, I want to ask you something real fast because I'm out of time. Do it. Do you think, because the box break, the thing about searching for the, 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 the really rare card, no. I understand the appeal, you're, 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 you're gambling. Yeah, yeah and it's a little bit of Willy Wonka. Like to you're totally. watching Willy Wonka. My question is, do you think the, the live box break and what they're doing can be applied to the toy industry and comic books in a way where you're buying, like, um, five toys, and you know what I mean? Like, and, and you're opening the box hoping that you're going to get this super rare yeah. thing, or you're, you're buying a, yeah. a bunch of comics, yeah. and you're hoping to get this graded 9.9 whatever yeah. of these new things. Do you, do you think this is applicable? Uh, uh, the answer is yes. Um, on the toy front, um, where it's applicable is that, you know, we've done like chase figures and these rare figures and whatever else. And sometimes the, uh, the actual customers don't really get a chance at them because very clever stock boys. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, people who work in the back room who are the ones that open them up have the knowledge or at least, even if they don't collect that specifically, but, but they that, do have the not. They're able to peel them off prior to it ever getting out. So if you could create sealed cases that had that opportunity and it never went through the normal channel. That's what I mean, though, yeah. specifically, is that, like, say McFarland Toys was creating, like, the, you know, cases of, and I know we have to wrap, but, like, you're, you're creating five toys and you're selling it directly to consumer the way that they're selling Correct. these these. Exactly. Uh, uh, if cards. you did it right, if you did it direct, the answer is yes. If you had somebody who you trust that had a keen eye that says, "Hey, I'm going to open up a box and I'm going to only peel out what I see because I'm 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 a pro. I'm going to peel out what I think is pre the best possible nine nine potential. If this sure. got graded, right, that's the one we're going to sell right here. This uh, this whole case. There are two books that if it was my own money, I'm the pro now. I would send these two books in because. I know what these look like, sure. right? Uh, yes, I think, I think it's applicable. On that note, sir, I could have asked you another thousand questions, but let's do that next year at Comic-Con. All right. Uh, Todd, thank you so much for coming in. Yeah, I appreciate you giving me the time. And again, thanks, thanks to everything you do and your platform. I really appreciate you being here. Uh, everyone, thank you.